here. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to talk about uh, social justice concepts and inclusivity, specifically for the student orgs that you're part of. So uh, before I get started and talk about just like expectations and kind of like what we're gonna be doing tonight, uh, I wanna do something called positionality because I just think it's important for all of you to know a little bit more about me, kind of like what angle I'm kind of approaching this from. Uh, so you'll see that my pronouns are el, for those that speak Spanish, he and him as well. Um, I've been working here at Center for Leadership and Involvement for about a year now. Uh, professionally outside of undergraduate, I've been working out for about five, six or six years. And I've been in a variety of different environments. I've worked in the nonprofit sector. I've worked in the corporate sector. I've worked in higher ed. And I've seen different work environments and I've seen leadership enacted in different capacities. And the one thing that I always wish would be a thing just so that we can bridge different gaps is that we can't use like a very broad approach for including community or people into our organizations. I think that we need to be very intentional about how we connect with folks. So what I additionally mean by that, so. Uh, I identify as Latinx, uh, specifically Guatemala. I come from a family of immigrants, and I think that really sets a specific uh, lens on my own experience, an experience where I felt like I've needed to negotiate with people about aspects of myself. I've had to fit in into certain organizations when they weren't as willing to modify things. And part of like my own goal, on top of teaching folks about leadership, is also teaching folks how to lead in these organizations or maybe the ones that you come from today and make them more inclusive for other people. Because not only is it better for those, those folks that uh, might be new to your organization, there's a lot of benefits to building an inclusive environment, which I kind of want to go over. Um, so you'll see up here on our agenda, there's a couple things that I want to touch on. Uh, I do think social justice connects directly with leadership development. So I wanna make those connections with you today. So I'll be using the leadership framework to talk about a lot of our concepts. Uh, and then I'm gonna dive a little bit into theory. You'll notice that there's these three areas specifically. Like one, what does it mean to, mean to lead inclusively? How do we audit your organization in terms of how inclusive it might be? And then how do we keep working on your skills so that you know what it means to be culturally responsible or as inclusive as possible? Um, even though I'm going to be diving into theory, and I could talk about that all day if you talk to some of my students, part of like student leadership program, uh, I want this to be as engaging as possible. So each tool or point that we're going over, there's an activity associated with it. Uh, there's going to be times for you to individually reflect, to share as part of a group and to break out into groups to go over some of these concepts. Uh, I'm using scaffolding today to teach. So basically what I mean by that is I'm using a concept to build off of each one. And hopefully that'll help with understanding for some of the topics that I'll be mentioning. Um, in terms of feelings, uh, I know that we are in a racialized context and that things feel racially divided. And that's not the only type of discrimination or injustice that exists. There's so many others. I mean, we can kind of get a dart and throw it on the diversity board if we want to look at maybe like disability or immigration status or the list kind of goes on and on. Um, I'm mentioning that because I know these types of conversations are contentious. They can be uncomfortable. They can be uncomfortable on both parts, whether you identify as someone that might be more on the dominant side of society or more on the underrepresented side of society. Um, I do not have answers for all the issues that might be on your mind for today, but at the very minimum, I hope that I can provide tools that you can take back to your student orgs so that you can have these difficult conversations. And after the fact, if you think that this information is really valuable, uh, I'm gonna share with you a way to reconnect with our office in case you wanna engage in this work more deeply. So. Hopefully that gives you a better sense of like what to expect for today. And again, I really appreciate you being here so we can have this conversation. So let's get the, the big theory out of the way first, then we'll get into some of the activities. Um, I'm not sure folks here, 
uh, are participating in the leadership certificate program, but that's the main way that you kind of get connected with our framework. Um, you'll see this tool up here on the screen. And really what my office tries to do with this, we just want it to be very clear to students when you go into a class or you go to a workshop on campus uh, that we're using a common language to talk about leadership. And there's a lot of theory that kind of goes into this and a lot of connections that we make so that we have this common language. So I'm actually not gonna go to in depth with like our values and competencies because we have another session that's related to the framework, but I just wanted you to know like, this is where I'm getting the content for today. Secondly, because we have values and competencies that work together to come up with our definitions of leadership, you'll notice that in this grid, we have uh, different actions associated with each value and competency. So for my content where I'm talking about inclusivity, I'm pulling from here to come up with my conversation points and with some of my tips and tricks that I have for you. So um, maybe you wanna engage with this framework a little bit more deeply, but that's kind of where all this information is coming from. And why is this important? Well, on this third slide, you'll notice that the things in the grid multiply. So there's different types of knowledge, different skills you can work on, different abilities related to leadership. All I'm trying to show here is that there is a direct connection with social justice and leadership development. And that's something that folks don't necessarily think about all the time. I think when folks think about leadership, sometimes they think about like professional development or like what are the, the things that I'm gonna do in the workplace, like communicating effectively, giving a great speech, uh, going along well with my workmates. But I think that for a lot of leadership concepts, you can center social justice on it and then it multiplies kind of the ways that we think about uh, how we kind of live with other people. So uh, here you'll notice, here's our definition for leadership framework, uh, for our leadership framework. And I kind of just went over that, but, if we dig deeper and we think a little bit more about what does leadership look like, but on top of that, what does a social justice perspective look like with leadership? There's some key points here. So one, at UW-Madison, we try to define leadership as actions, things that you do to make change happen. And specifically, it does not need to be based on position or authority. So this is not to call you all out, but in, your, in the chat, you listed your different positions and titles that you're part of for your student orgs. I'm not criticizing that, that's great. You need to have structure so that folks know what tasks are associated with your student org and where you kind of go along. All I'm trying to say though is there's a difference between saying like, Allison, I'm not picking on you. Uh, there's a difference between saying like, I am a fundraising officer Therefore, you must listen to everything that I say because I have officer in my title versus I am a fundraising officer, part of our leadership team, and I'm here to help us with getting money for our organization, but I'm willing to help people with other things that are here. I just want to provide direction for my group. I'm not saying that any of y'all are using that specific mindset about like, if I have a title, therefore I have power, but I want to challenge that. I want you to think about what does it mean when you're part of leadership for your organization and what is associated with that. Secondly, with the way that we define leadership, I believe that every, every context you're in matters. Every situation matters when you're working with others. So at one point, I imagine when you came to UW-Madison, you didn't have your specific title. You were a member. You were interested in getting more involved and you wanted to see how can I use my skills to drive this forward? And in that situation, in that context, you realized I have the potential to make change because I think I am valuable to the student org and let's, let's make that happen. Now, it, hopefully this is not too surprising. Not every member feels that way in your student org. And there could be many reasons for that. And I'm going to argue tonight that some of those reasons are related to identity and different barriers. It might be because of race and ethnicity. It might be because of cultural context and language. It might be because of their economic situation. And then we realize, huh, every member should be treated differently. That's what I mean by unique engagement. 
And I should think more intentionally about my processes in my student org so that they feel as welcome as possible. So we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. And then finally, because we talked about action with leadership, it is also the phenomena of positive change. Now, I think when folks think of positive change, they just mean like, what is the most impactful thing that I can do? Or what are the broad numbers of things that I do that can make change? But if we look at the definition of positive change, like if we go into Webster's or something like that, positive change also means not just impact, it also means the relationships you build with people. So I think true positive change has to be mutual. Everyone's voice needs to be included when you're thinking about how you want to make an impact. Because then if you don't do that, that's very one-sided. So again, we're gonna talk about more strategies kind of related to this. So hopefully this kind of sets up uh, some of the topics that I wanna talk about. Um, and you can start to begin to see how leadership is connected with inclusivity. Because at the end of the day, what my hopes are, based on those two bullet points you see on the screen, that everyone can be their truest self. Everyone can bring themselves up on board and know it's not just about diversity. So it's not just about having different types of people in your organization. It's about honing in on their skills and abilities and strengths and also respecting them as a person and letting them know that all aspects of their being are valued because then that's when you start breaking down barriers and that's when you start truly building an inclusive organization. All right, so here's the first tool that I wanna talk about for today, the idea of inclusive leadership. So I'll talk concept first and then we'll go into an activity. So uh, a question that I get commonly from students, faculty, staff, okay, Larry, you've convinced me. Maybe social justice has something to do with leadership but what the heck does it look like? So here's a definition that we can kind of work off from. Uh, I know I didn't ask folks for majors, but I got this from business literature. So when I think about inclusive leadership, I'm thinking about as a leader with your power or your positionality, whether you're the president of your organization or if you're an advisor or whatnot, I was just looking at titles in the chat. How are you using your power or positionality so that folks feel included as part of your group and that they're included and sharing that power with you to help make decisions? So you might be asking, well, why would I do that? I think there's a lot of benefits to not sharing that. Well, here are some reasons for that. The more that you can make people feel included as part of decision making and as part of their group, you're going to retain members. So I don't know what the landscape is for some of your student orgs, but I do know some student orgs uh, deal with uh, ineffective uh, retention of members. This is a reason why you want to go towards that. Uh, another reason, and this is not a surprise in a racialized moment, it helps you think about what does it mean to have equitable processes for your student org? Um, because if you're if you are putting the group member forward and thinking about how to include them, it'll have you think more critically about the ways that you need to do that. Uh, I think in business uh, theory, there's a lot of benefits to just being able to work collaboratively because you have more solutions to problems. Uh, and then finally, that last point right there, um, folks will feel, if they feel fully included, then they will feel well, they will feel less stressed, they'll feel more willing to contribute. So I think that with the leadership framework, we can try and practice inclusive leadership and making sure that we're making this a priority, not just for yourself, but for the rest of your student work. Um, maybe you've seen this activity before. Uh, I'm not gonna go super in depth on Identity 101 because I think the Office of Inclusive Ex Education has a great process for that. This is just to kickstart our thinking, okay? So just uh, follow along with me because I swear this will connect to our other concepts. In that wheel, I want you to think about which of our identities do you think about most often and which ones do you think about least? So just write that down on your sheet for right now. When I refer to identity, by, by the way, it's those classifications I meant. So like race and ethnicity, gender, uh, uh, immigration, like immigration or legal status, if you're thinking about that, uh, religion, that can be something else. So just kind of list those on your sheet. 
Uh, here's the next question. So you thought about yourself now. You've thought about what is most dominant for you to think about and what you might not think about all the time. What barriers do you think people would face when they want to participate in a group? And think about this from yourself for the identi identities that you listed for yourself. If you just want to write that in the chat, uh, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah. So just to give you an example, uh, being from California, myself, and being Latinx, a lot of folks in community college, they speak Spanish and English is not their primary language. So a barrier for them in a group is that in a lot of organizations, they only use English to talk about their materials or things like that. So a lot of folks can't participate. So I'm just providing that as an example. So if you just wanna write your examples in the chat, I can unpack those. This graphic up on the screen, uh, not to push you in a certain direction, but in case you need some ideas too. I just didn't wanna share that right away. Just checking in one more time. Uh, do folks need more time? I don't, I don't know if folks are writing things in the chat or not. Cool, thank you, Christine. Larry, are you thinking about what we have difficulty with in the group or what others might have difficulty with accessing our group? Just Either or. What direction you're coming as an org. And you can do it from your perspective or from someone else's perspective. That's totally up to you. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, folks are kind of writing ideas. I'm gonna try and unpack some of this stuff in here. So, uh, Christine mentions that being one or few of a minority individuals within a larger group, i.e. the only woman in the group, and maybe feeling less willing to speak up as you may not be taken seriously by the men present or be interrupted. So yes, Christine, thank you for talking about uh, uh, gender inequality and like barriers related to gender. That, that is true. That, that does affect uh, many relations amongst people. And it feels like power is distributed in certain ways that feel very unbalanced. So keep that in the back of your mind because I think that'll be helpful for like our next activities. Ben. Uh, organizational leadership is predominantly white, which may deter some people. Yes, I think you're talking about the issue of representation. Uh, it, yeah, psychologically, if you just see people that look like you, you're more willing to join. So hopefully we can think a little bit more about that. From Savannah, uh, physical disabilities limit activities for people where there is a lack of access with only stairs, needing to be able to lift or walk long distances for certain activities. Thank you so much for talking about that perspective too. Uh, I imagine for your student orgs, you probably have events or workshops or trainings or different things like that. Uh, virtually, this has been a miracle for some people because now they can access more things. Uh, maybe that's how you think a little bit more about your trajectory uh, in a post-COVID world, but thank you for mentioning that. Catherine, uh, socioeconomic class. People not might be able to afford to join a club when they could be working. That is a big issue, and that is something that we think about a lot. Um, imagine for your positions, a lot of it's probably volunteer-based, so you're just doing it because you like the interests or you like the people, and you're willing to give time. But maybe that's something good to think about. How do we make it more accessible from an economic standpoint? And finally, from Stephanie, uh, since women is in our org's name, men may feel like they aren't able to join our org. Yeah. Actually, I thought that right now. I don't know if that's not actually the case. Um, and then if you think about gender as a spectrum, that could be very limiting to just think about men and women. Um, so there's a lot to kind of unpack through as well. But um, I'm not going to go in depth in terms of like different barriers to access. I just want you to think about those barriers to access. I and mean, oftentimes, I feel like being in college is like a bubble because we're with our friends, we're working on very specific issues. Sometimes we think that what we might see outside, for example, up here in this circle, like you know, issues with the economy, and like uh, our federal administration putting up issues, and then this whole broad history of colonization, like it doesn't really affect us. There are trickle down effects, and we do need to think critically about how we do things with our organizations. So let's go into that next. Thank you, y'all, for um, participating in that. 
So now I want to go over another tool. You have a better sense of what barriers might look like and how that relates to you. Now I want you to think about your student org as a whole. So what I have up here on the screen is a modified tool that I created because I took this out from like an anti-racist uh, model. And I just made this like an inclusivity model. So I think this applies for many different types of identity. So let me just define those four up here. Think of this as a spectrum. And also think of this as you can be in multiple states depending on what your processes look like. So uh, exclusive organizations are ones that do not take into account the differences that other people bring. It has a very top-down power structure and is not willing to engage in collaborative decision-making. A token organization would be one that uh, visually or up front, it might look like they value like diversity. And whenever I think about diversity, uh, that is like not true like equity or justice. It's not enough to just bring people in, but a token organization believes that that is the right way to go about things. Could still have a top-down power structure, may not necessarily value the contributions of folks that uh, are coming in and are underrepresented. Now, a multicultural organization, and this is actually the one that most folks are commonly in. Uh, believe it or not, it's pretty unpopular to uh, be a, an organization that says, like, we want to be racist. Um, I do think most folks are well-intentioned and want to include other people as part of their communities. Uh, so a multicultural organization has processes in place to try to diversify their group has some collaborative decision-making processes in place, um, tries to recognize the contributions that other people bring, but maybe they're not willing to change some of the ways that they communicate or the way that they ascribe leadership. Uh, maybe they'll talk about issues about social justice, but not talk about themselves directly or will not be vulnerable about the things that affect them. A lot of times multicultural organizations will also not think about power and how power affects other people. They'll just subscribe themselves to like a typical, like, uh, like a hierarchy in terms of like how positions kind of work. And then finally, an inclusive organization is one that seeks to be transformative. You will see it transformative in terms of like the composition of who is in the student org. Uh, I would even say going beyond like dominant narratives of what inclusivity, inclusivity looks like. I think oftentimes we think about race and ethnicity, uh, but for example, and I think Savannah brought up a good point, a lot of times we don't think about disabilities. A lot of times we don't think about uh, folks that might be undocumented and how that might affect them in the college environment. You need to think out more outside of the box. What else does inclusivity look like? Um, you're more willing to work in a horizontal structure. That might be another example. You might be willing to think more about equity rather than e equality. So like if you know someone is struggling more with funds, you might put in a policy where like everyone gets $10. No, not everyone needs $10. Maybe that person needs $50 and other members should be okay with not getting money. So just some examples of like what that looks like. Let's go deeper now. So as an example, I wanted to talk about culture as one of those ways to think about where do I fall on the organizational identity spectrum. I've talked about some of these examples already, um, and I just want you to see like what, what do these examples kind of look like. Now, you can be in different areas. So for example, you might be a mostly multicultural organization because you are trying to address prejudice because you are trying to make your organization diverse, but maybe you're not learning about social justice concepts. Maybe you're doing the bare minimum of compliance and doing bias training, as an example. See how it's kind of a spectrum and you can be in different sections. Uh, maybe you are actively recruiting and mentoring marginalized people and encouraging a horizontal structure, but maybe you're also uncomfortable with conflict and addressing power. So I think you can have your foot in different sections of this, but it's good to call this out 
because then you can address things head on and be more clear about how you want to be an inclusive organization. There are different ways to look at this too. And I think these are all relevant for student organizations in case you need examples of like, how do I start challenging our structure? How do I start challenging the, our dominant ways of doing? Um, and there's different ways to do this. It might be re related to like, you know, is it reasonable to just ask people to volunteer or should we be paying them? Uh, are we getting funding from certain areas that value on concepts of social justice, or are we taking money from folks that are marginalizing other people, even though we're not doing that? Are we thinking about where our events are located and where they kind of take place? Who has a say in how things happen in an organization? And for the folks that are not in leadership positions, how can they have more of a say? So that's where all of these bullet points kind of come through, and maybe that kind of helps with your thinking. But that was a lot of me talking. So I'm actually gonna break you out in two breakout groups now. And if you go back into that drive, you'll see the group discussion part of the worksheet. These are the questions that I want you to discuss in your breakout rooms, where we're gonna spend about 10 minutes doing that. Look again at that spectrum and think about where does your organization fall on that spectrum? If you say to me, Larry, I think we're actually multicultural and inclusive, that's fine. Just make sure that you're ready to kind of think about how you stand there. Then I want you to think about the way your organization runs. Where do your practices fall in that spectrum? I think you can start listing those based on what we talked about. And then I want you to mention among your group, what barriers do those create depending on what your practices are? So uh, any questions before I put you out into your breakout groups? Okay, I will be uh, stopping in both. I will not talk because I want y'all to have the floor, but uh, in case you do have questions because they might pop up. So just give me a second to do this. All right, you should be able to join your room now. Okay, so, um, a lot of awesome ideas that were being thrown around in terms of uh, how do you start breaking down these barriers? It seems like the idea of changing organizational structure resonated with some people. Uh, having specific roles related to encouraging inclusivity uh, was an idea. Thinking about your funding sources uh, and where money is coming from. Thinking about how to intentionally help others fundraise so that they can access your services. Uh, and also thinking about your recruitment efforts, just some ideas that people were kind of mentioning. So uh, I just wanna say thank you for engaging in the conversation and really thinking about this. And I know 10 minutes is not enough to think and talk about this. I just wanted you to use this theory of practice so that you at least know how you can use it. Um, so let's go on to the next part. Uh, besides, auditing your organization and besides thinking about uh, identities and how that relates to inclusive leadership, we also need to exercise our knowledge about how to be culturally competent so that we can understand where others are coming from. So I'm actually pulling this straight from the leadership certificate program, which we engage with uh, the chancellor and the Wisconsin idea to come up with this definition. But basically, uh, global and cultural competence is what's listed here. Uh, the different ways that we think about how we respect other communities, other people, uh, their backgrounds. But I, the part that I bolded, which I think is most important, is that it never ends. You don't, we don't take an ethnic studies course and then that's, it's it. We don't go to like six workshops on social justice and we're like, oh, got it done. Uh, and I just think that that is such a big flaw in our learning. Uh, and you don't just see this in higher education. You see this in K-12. to You might have seen this in high school where you were able to take one course on ethnic studies. You see this in the professional world. 
uh, you'll see companies that'll have like a, a week long diversity retreat. And then that's the solution to creating social justice in the world. And none of that is true. You have to continuously engage in this process of learning so that we can move towards a more inclusive environment. Now, you might be thinking, great, now Larry has exact solutions for how to do this. I don't have anything new to share with you, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm just gonna reiterate what other people have said. And maybe this is just uh, disappointing. Yeah, I guess it is disappointing. I wish we lived in the culture where this is just ingrained in what we do, but it's not. So I'm gonna go over this. Um, one, in that first activity, you thought about what identities were most pertinent or important to you. That means that you should have a learning list then because you also listed which ones you don't think about or which ones that you could do more work on. I hope you use that to think about what else should you do be doing research on. Secondly, um, it is important to think about how our communication comes across. And I don't mean just from like a semantics or grammar perspective. I literally mean language. Uh, yes, I know English it is the most common form of thinking about how to engage in like politics or economics and finance and whatnot. But there are so many other languages that exist. Uh, I'm not sure if folks here are bilingual or multilingual or are interested in language, but maybe that's something that you can put on your bucket list for later. What's another language that you can learn? Um, I would also challenge you to think about what sources of information or news are you looking at? Uh, I fall in that trap. I fall in the trap of only reading liberal content because that is the politic that I ascribe to and that is what I want to hear and that is what makes me happy. Uh, but I've challenged myself in the past year to read other sources and even if I greatly disagree with them with a large passion. I at least want to know what that perspective is so I can have conversations with other people. Um, that fourth point about appreciating the diversity of other cultures, there's a lot of ways to do this. And there's a lot of ways to do it that are not culturally uh, appropriative. Um, there, right now, Native November is happening. And I don't know if any folks have gone to events related to that. And not all of them are related to academics. Some of them are related to like food or like dress or things like that. That counts. You should go to that so you can learn about other cultures because I think that's vital. And then finally, you need to ascribe to yourself to continuous learning. Um, one of my main quirks is when folks ask me, hey, I want to do something about police brutality. Where do I donate money? Uh, I don't know. Do you want to affect it at the local level? Do you care about justice at the federal level? What kind of brutality are you referring to? Are there specific communities that you're thinking about? See, we have such a powerful tool, which people refer to as Google or just internet search. You should be doing your research before you ask questions like that. Because there's so many different locations where you can donate money or find information or take a look at stuff. I'm basically just saying, let's all make an effort to trying to find some answers to these questions that we have and then come up with more in-depth or descriptive questions because then we'll have more meaningful conversations. So I think that's what I'm trying to get across with that fifth bullet point. Now, you might be thinking, well, how is this relevant to my student org? Um, let's guide you through some individual reflection. So back in that Google Drive, you're gonna see the individual reflection question list. You can use that to kind of think and write responses for what I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna give you about 30 to 40 seconds for each question I'm gonna list. Yes, this might be an easy or softball question folks might call, but what does diversity mean to you? Okay, so you listed what it means to you. 
what does the diversity look like in your student org? Now that you've thought about that, I want you to think about the folks that are not in your organization. Or I want you to think about folks that might be in the minority in your organization. Do you know who they are? And I'm not just referring to, uh, yes, I have seen them before. Do you know their name? Do you know where they're from? Do you know what they like to do? Do you know what classes they're taking? That's what I mean by it. Do you know who these people are? Which I allude to my next question. Have you specifically reached out to them? Have you welcomed them directly with purpose to your organization? Now that you've thought about diversity and what it might look like in your organization, how do you celebrate that? How do you respect that? How do you acknowledge the, the richness of diversity that might exist in your organization? If the answer is, I'm not sure, or we don't, we can write that down. That's totally fine. And I'm talking about you for this next question. But what steps have you taken to learn more about those folks that might be in underrepresented in your organization. I gave you an out with that last question where you can say, I don't know, or we don't. Uh, you cannot use your out for this question. If you don't have, if you haven't taken any steps, I'd like you to write down a step that you would like to take. Our next question, this one's harder, that's fine. How does your org empower those members given their identities? Based on what we talked about today and what I've heard in your breakout rooms, I feel like you know how to do that. You came up with some strategies or talked about some strategies. So just like the last question, if you don't feel like you're doing that directly, how would you do that? What do you wanna prioritize when you leave tonight? So thank you for going through some of that guided reflection with me. Again, I cannot solve your problems in the next three minutes, but I hope that this reflection at least helped you think about how do I begin to address these problems? So you'll see up in the blue, it says honoring context and culture. This is what I walked with you together tonight. From our leadership framework, I use this competency to talk about strategies that you can use to become a more inclusive organization. And specifically, we talked about three tools. We talked about how do you instill the ideas of inclusive leadership so that you as a student org leader 
can begin prioritizing that and showing that for the rest of your members. We talked about uh, the work that needs to be done with cultural competence. And we walked through questions to think about what would that look like for myself and the rest of my organization to be able to value other cultures and people. And I know we did this secondly, but I think that the two above is the work that we do. Then we get to the third one. And the third one would be, uh, what is the organizational audit that we can do? You know, If you feel comfortable being an inclusive leader and you feel that you're actively engaging in this learning, what specific steps can you take to come up with a strategy or plan in order to transform your organization? So hopefully, if we use one or more of those tools, you'll be able to come through those mutual benefits that we talked about, so those goals that are meaningful for all, and we can start creating or rebuilding. I'm not sure what kind of history your org has. Uh, or strengthening the relationships that we have among people. Because I assure you, there's a lot of benefits to doing that. And I assume that's why you're here today. Um, so yeah, I again, I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate you um, engaging and taking part in these activities. I hope that it was really helpful. Um, let me just stop recording real quick.